Before scripture reading, many of us have had the opportunity to go to Branson, Missouri. A very tragic accident has happened. Many lives were lost. And I'd like to offer a prayer on behalf of those and those that survived. Father, we thank you so much. We ask that you be with us as we spend this time with you today. Father, we especially ask you to be with those families that lost loved ones in the recent accident in Branson. Be with those that survived. Father, we know that you have a plan for each and every one of us. Sometimes we don't understand that plan completely. But Father, we just ask that we might be a benefit to those that have lost loved ones, be a benefit to those that have survived and will continue to live a life here on this earth. Father, guide us and guard us. All this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Look carefully when you, then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Making the best use of time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Good morning. I think we're going to have to talk to Dennis Bartley about what's going on in children's worship. Those kids did not want to go today. <laughs> I'm not sure what, what's going on. It is uh, it's good to see so many of you here this morning. Jer Jerry mentioned about the tragedy that happened in Branson. And, and uh, if you read the Christian Chronicle, you might know or follow them online. Uh, there were actually two members of the church that, that died on that uh, duck boat. And just as, as almost as interesting aside, it does show us the brevity of life. It does show us the importance of having a relationship with Jesus Christ. One of the ones that died was a young man. He was 15 years old. And his youth minister wrote the article and said, I was blessed to baptize him just a year ago. And just a week, he delivered his first uh, gospel sermon. And, and to me, it shows just how brief life is. It shows just what a small window of time that we have. And so if, you, uh, if there is someone in your life that you have been hesitant to share the gospel with, someone in your life that needs to hear about the saving grace of Jesus Christ, their life could be gone just that quickly. I'm thankful that that youth minister and other people had that influence on that young man. I'm thankful that he was in a good relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and while his loss is tragic, I'm thankful he's with his Father in heaven today. And so, uh, that's the first sermon for today. Sorry, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to the second one here in a moment. But um, that was just on my heart, something I wanted to share with you uh, this morning. Um, <clears throat> I want to begin by letting everyone know today is the fourth Sunday, so that means we will have uh, care groups meeting all over the place today, so make sure to look that up and know where your care group is meeting. Uh, that means that tonight we won't be back here this evening. We'll, we expect you to be at home with your families, enjoying that time together, so please do that this evening. 
We've had another great week of summer learning camp, over 50 kids again this week. And this coming week, uh, starting on Tuesday, this is our last sessions of summer learning camp. And I want to say this to everyone. If you have been involved in summer learning camp in any way, shape, or form, I want to say thank you. And I want you to realize that you have had an influence on the life of children this summer. And maybe they'll be uh, one of those someday, one of those children or those teens that you can share the gospel with because we are building uh, relationships and planting those seeds right now. So I'm thankful for all that have, have made that work. Uh, let's finish strong this week. If you've worked in summer learning camp, we expect to see you this week. If you've never worked in summer learning camp and just want to see what it's like this week, drop by. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. Emma's going to start the second grade, and that's, that's hard for me as a parent to, to kind of swallow, but it's reality. She's going to start the second grade here in August. And she was given an actual list of books to read this summer that she has to write reports about. Now, I don't know about you, but this whole summer reading and writing reports thing in my life didn't happen until high school, but they're starting younger and younger. And I have really enjoyed getting to watch her read those books, write those reports, and it makes me think about my own growing up and some of the books that, that we had to read uh, in elementary school and middle school and in high school. As I dwell on those things, I think about that, I am reminded of probably my favorite book that I read in high school, and that was The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Very early on in this novel, you begin to become acquainted with the titular character, Jay Gatsby. You find out that he is a veteran of World War I, that he is a reclusive millionaire, that he throws parties at his estate, but he never takes part. He just sits back and watches the people as they enjoy their time. The story is told through his neighbor, a young man that's just recently graduated from college as a bond salesman, and you, you very quickly learn that while Gatsby has all of this money, while he has this large estate, he's really not that happy. He's running away from a life of poverty that he knew as a young man. He made his money in less than legal ways by bootlegging, and he is in love with a married woman. This is one of my favorite books that I've ever read, but in a way, it's a very tragic book. It's a very tragic novel. It's, it shows where once we had envy for this great and powerful Gatsby, now we see nothing but a man to be pitied. And we like books like this. We like to escape from reality and get caught up in that story and those characters. We, we like to see them succeed, and we hate to see it when they fail. What's unfortunate is that in our society, we have turned to novels like this to look for our heroes. We have turned to novels like this to find qualities to include in our life and to emulate in our lives. This morning, I want to share with you this. If you are looking for characters and heroes to emulate, you don't have to go any further than the pages of Scripture. Because contained within the pages of Scripture are men and women who live their lives for the cause of Jesus Christ. Contained within the pages of Scripture are men and women that are just like you and I, that are flawed individuals that allowed God to use them. Contained within the pages of Scripture are all of the characters that you would need to live a life that's worth living. And if there's any place in the Bible that we can go to to learn about living a life that's worth living, it is the book of Psalms. I was asked, uh, I'm, I've been asked to go next month and to speak at the Eastridge Congregation in Rockwall. And they asked me to choose a chapter of Psalms to preach over. And, you know, that's a great book, and there's a lot of chapters to look at. And, and I considered several, but I ended up at the first one, in Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1 has long since been a favorite chapter in the Bible for me. In fact, looking back as I was preparing this lesson, I remember that as a young man, this was the first passage of Scripture that I ever read to our congregation when I was growing up. And so to me, this is a very special passage of Scripture but the older I get, the more, in love I fall with this, the more in love I fall with this passage because there are so many good things for us today. Join me in reading <clears throat> Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. 
but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and, it, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. If you want to live a life that is worth living, then Psalm chapter 1 will set you on the right path. The man that's being described here is living a life that is described as blessed. And I, I'm thankful to Bert for talking to us just a little bit this morning about the difference between the gambling term of lucky and the godly term of blessed, because they are two very different things. And this morning, I hope that you're living a life that's worth living. But if you're not, and you want to get started on the right path, then I encourage you to engage this morning as we look at Psalm chapter 1. As been mentioned, it, it begins by saying, blessed is the man. A and blessed is one of those words that, unfortunately, has kind of fallen into the vernacular of the day. People say it in a very flip manner. They use it to describe things like finding a good parking space, or they use it to describe very trivial things. A few years ago, we took Emma to see the movie, Alexander and the Hor Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. Try saying that five times fast. Uh, some of you probably read that when you were children. Some of you have read it to your children or your grandchildren. And in one of the characters in the movie, he was the older brother. He, was a, he wasn't the best example for a young Alexander. <clears throat> As he's describing his own life, he, he starts to list off all these good things in his life. He goes, and you know what, just, just hashtag blessed. That, that's what he said about his life in a very flip way. Well, that's not the kind of blessed that's being talked about here. The, in the Hebrew language, this word blessed is describing a man whose relationship with the Lord is the reason for being blessed. It's describing a man who has decided to not allow himself to be polluted by the things of this world and yet revels in that relationship with the Lord. In the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the word makarios is used. And that word makarios is a very often used word for blessed in the New Testament. And it actually has the connotation of someone who would be envied because of their blessings. Their life would be so full of blessing, their relationship with God would be so evident that people would actually envy them because of that relationship. That is the kind of life that God wants us to have. You, you may hear me expound upon this idea of blessed and say, well, that's just something that preachers enjoy. That's just chasing a rabbit in the language, in the original languages. But that's not what it is. God expects us to live a life that is blessed. He expects us to live a life that has a relationship with Him. A life that is worth living is best described as blessed. And if your life is not described as blessed, then you need to start living a life that could be described as blessed. He does something interesting here, the writer. He talks about walking, sitting, and standing. And he says there are three things that the blessed man does not do. It says that he does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, that he does not stand in the way of the sinners, and he does not sit in the seat of of scoffers and if you're reading quickly if you're not trying to absorb what the what the content of the book says you're going to miss something very interesting here because you see the writer is talking about every station of life this man could have he's talking about him walking and being about and in the world he's talking about him standing and the way that he lives he's talking about him sitting these are all the stations of life that we can occupy. This is a very common literary tactic used in the Old Testament, most notably in the book of Deuteronomy, in the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children as you talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk 
by the way, when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. In this case, the writer is talking about how we impart the Word of God to our children. He's talking about how we should share that. But again, he's using this idea that every station of your life should be imparting the Word of God to your children and to those around you. If we're going to live this blessed life like we read about in Psalm chapter 1, then every station of our life must have these qualities. But what do these things mean? It begins by saying that he does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Simply put, he has chosen his friends well. He does not associate with people that are wicked people, that are sinful people. I am thankful in my life that the people I have chosen as friends all have a good moral compass, and most of them are lovers of God, and I am thankful for that. If we're going to live a life that's worth living, we need to be very careful about whom we choose to spend our time with. We need to be very careful in looking at the qualities of the people that we associate with. Now, does this mean that God expects us to never have any association with sinners? No, that's not what it means. Because if we never have an association with sinners, how are we supposed to reach people that don't know God and His Son, Jesus Christ? The, the person that's being described here, this man in Psalm chapter 1, has painstakingly surrounded himself with good people. He has made sure that there are people that will help him to make the kinds of decisions that he needs to make in his life so he can set a good example. It says that he does not stand in the way of sinners. And, and the first time I ever read this, and even up until not that long ago when I read this, this kind of confused me. Because I read it and I thought what it meant was that he doesn't get in the way of sinners. That he doesn't stop someone when he sees them committing a sin of some kind. But that's not what it's talking about. The writer is saying that he does not stand in the way of sinners. He does not live like a sinner. He doesn't act like a sinner. He doesn't talk like a sinner. He doesn't walk like a sinner. He walks like somebody who has a relationship with God. And if we're going to be God's people living this blessed life, then we cannot look like a sinner. We cannot allow the things of this world to pollute our relationship and our lives. We must stand and be bold for something that is bigger than us something that is only found in a relationship with God and His Son, Jesus Christ. It says that He does not sit in the seat of scoffers. When this was written, it was a very common practice for people that did not understand, did not appreciate, did not like something to find like-minded people, for them to gather, for them to plot against those that they did not believe, that they did not think were right. And they would even go as far as to do harm to those people. As God's people, we're going to run into people that don't believe the same things that we believe. We're going to meet people that are in direct opposition to what we see in God's Word as being the direction of our lives. And we cannot sit in the seat of a scoffer. We cannot be a mocker of these people. We need to build relationships with these people. We need to show them that Christians are good people, and they simply want to have a relationship with them. And then and only then can a dialogue take place, can a free exchange of ideas take place. This is what it means to be blessed. This is what it means to have that kind of relationship with God and to live a life that's worth living. All of this comes back to the idea of the company that you keep. This last week in, in learning camp, I was in the character room, and, and Donnell was teaching, and we had, some, we had some kids that were just a little antsy. We haven't had a single bad kid this year. I want to I wanna go on record as saying that. But you know how kids get. They've, they've been here for a while. They start getting a little bit antsy. And Donnell said something that profoundly affected this sermon this week. She said to those children, make sure that you're sitting next to someone that will help you make good choices. And I think that's just profound, because it's exactly what we're called upon to do as Christians. Make sure that you are living your life among people that are going to help you make good choices. 
Make sure that you're living with people and, and surrounding yourself with people that are going to help you eventually get to heaven and take as many people as you can with you. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians says, Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. The choices that you make for, in friendships, the people that you choose to associate with, can be the greatest asset in your life but they can also be the greatest detriment in your life if you don't choose wisely. The man that is described as blessed delights in the law of the Lord and he meditates on it daily. doesn't mean that he endures a preacher's sermon every Sunday. It means that he loves the Word of God, that it is food for his soul, that it is something that he looks forward to. That, that when the first day of the week arrives for us, we should look forward to coming together as God's people and not simply endure the Word of God or, or just learn Scripture so that we can win arguments with people from different backgrounds of faith. Our delight should be in the law of the Lord. Our meditations should be on that word. We should look at that word as our spiritual food that lifts us up and fills us up and we should share that as we go along. The kind of life that this man was, le was living was that that he enjoyed, that he delighted in the law of the, of the Lord, and that it exuded out of him as he was going down the road, as he was living his life. One of my favorite Christian recording artists is the group Cabin's Call, and they have a song called We Delight. And the opening line of that song is, We Delight... In the law of your word, we delight in the son who was perfect from birth. We delight in the day that he's returning to earth. Hallelujah. This is the words that we should be thinking. If we want to delight in the law of the Lord, this is how our mindset should be. We should enjoy that word. We should enjoy studying that word together. We should enjoy sharing that word with the people that we meet. If we want to live a life that's worth living, then we need to learn to delight in the law and the meditations of the Lord. I've been thinking a lot this week about summer because, well, let's face it, it's hot outside. And it's unavoidable that it's summer. It's unavoidable that we are right in the thick of it. I've been thinking about how I grew up and, and the things that I did in the summer. And when I was a teenager, a lot of my summer was spent at church camp, specifically at, at Camp Bandina in the lovely Texas Hill Country. And that camp is situated along the banks of the Medina River. In the late 70s, the Medina River uh, had a flood, and the houses and the trees and things that were along the banks of that river were swept away. You can actually walk along the roads uh, by the bank of that river and see where houses used to be. There's actually foundations still sitting where houses used to be that were swept away. And if you were to go and walk down the banks of the Medina River, you would see a few trees left that are big and have long branches that are tall that reach up to the sky. And those are like the tree that is being described here in Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is this man. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yield its fruit in season. Those trees that survived that great flood, and several since then, by the way, had deep roots. They were down far into the ground, and that water could not sweep them away. If we're going to live a life that's worth living, then we have to have deep roots, but not roots that are in the ground, which will wash away someday, roots that are in God and His Son, Jesus Christ. Those are the only things that are not going to be swept away. Those are the only things that are eternal, and we must have those deep roots. It describes this tree as, as one that was planted by streams of water. I can remember being a boy and, and growing up and going with my grandfather, with my papa out to his garden, and he would teach me how to care for the plants and the trees that were in that garden. He would teach me how to make sure I watered those effectively so that they would grow and they would be strong. In the Old Testament, when this was written, when you would go to plant a tree, you would make sure that there were multiple water sources by, nearby so that tree would grow and be strong. You would make sure that there were streams of water that were intersecting, that that tree would always have the water it needed. You would even go as far as to dig 
a, a trench from a river and divert water to make sure that that tree had all the water that it ever needed. These were intentional choices. These were thoughtful choices. And if we're going to live a life that's worth living, then we must start making intentional and thoughtful choices about where we are placed. We must make sure that we are placing ourselves in positions where we will be nourished and taken care of, much like that tree was nourished and taken care of. We must plant ourselves where streams of water can intersect and help us to grow. But in this case, it's living water that we are hoping to to uh, intersect and to help us grow and to be strong. If we're going to be like that tree, if we're going to be like the tree planted by streams of water, then we must be diligent and we must be thoughtful and we must be intentional. A life that is worth living is one that is a life of purpose. It is a life that is made up of, of choices that were not made in the heat of the moment, that were not made due to situational ethics, but choices that were made long ago that help us to be rooted and established where we need to be, much like that tree that was planted by the streams of water. Productivity should mark the life worth living. When this tree that's planted by the streams of water was in season, it, its branches would be loaded with fruit. That, those branches would hang down to the ground because they were so heavy. And that fruit was good to taste. It tasted good. It was enjoyable. But it was also good for nourishment. It helped people grow and to be strong physically. Have you ever noticed that someone that is living a life that's worth living, someone that is doing the right things, have you ever noticed that people gravitate towards those kinds of people? That they want to be around them, that they want to spend time with them. Because you see, the life that is worth living is almost as much for the person living it as it is for the person that isn't living it. When we live lives that are worth living and we allow people to come into our lives, we then have a great opportunity. We have an opportunity to share with them why our lives look like they do. Because I'm here to tell you that you, can ne you, will, you will rarely win somebody over to, to the Lord by beginning by telling them everything that's wrong in their life, by telling them what terrible people they are, by telling them why they're not going to go to heaven. You don't get a chance to build a relationship that way. But when you are living a blessed life, when you're living a life that's worth living, people want to know why you're living that life. They want to be a part of your life. And so you get to build a relationship with that person. You get to build a friendship with that person. And before too long, because you're living this life worth living, because you're living a blessed life and it's blessed by God, you're going to have the opportunity to share with them what is most important to you. And that is your relationship with Jesus Christ. And you get to produce that fruit. You get to do that when you're living a life that's worth living. The writer at this point shifts gears a little bit. He's been talking about this life that's worth living. He's been talking about this great and blessed man. And he shifts his gears and he starts to talk about the wicked. And he describes the wicked as chaff. Now, that's not a term we hear real often in our society anymore. We're not in an agrarian society anymore, but, but chaff is what is left over after grain is harvested. And chaff has no productive use at all. You can't eat it. You can't use it to make things with. It is, use, it is a useless byproduct of wheat. And this is how he describes the wicked, they lack substance. They are like chaff. We see this language again in the book of Matthew when uh, John the Baptist says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear the threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn but the chaff will burn with unquenchable fire. 
John the Baptist is using this analogy here. The wheat are those that are in a saved relationship with Jesus Christ. The wheat are those that have chosen to live this life of purpose. And the chaff are those that have chosen to not live a life in accordance with the will of God. They are the ones that will be burned in a fire. And it is a fire that is hotter and more consuming than anything here on earth. It is an eternity spent in hell with Satan. The life that is worth living has substance. It has productivity, and not substance and productivity that is marked by worldly standards, but substance and productivity that is marked by the blessed life that comes from a relationship with God and His Father, Jesus Christ. Eventuality is a, it's an, interesting con, it's an interesting concept to me because every situation has an eventuality. Sir Isaac Newton said that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Simply put, every action has consequences. The life that is lived and marked as blessed has a consequence. And the life that is wicked, that lacks substance, also has a consequence. The life that is, is lived without substance, the life that is wicked, the life that is described as chaff, in this chapter, will not have an enduring legacy. What do you want to be said about you after you die? What do you want to be remembered for that you did here on earth? What's interesting to me, and the more I live, the more I notice this, people that live a life of purpose, people that live this blessed life, are remembered. They have this legacy that goes on sometimes hundreds, if not thousands of years after they have died. And the people that live a wicked life, the people that live a life with no substance, are very often forgotten. And if they're not forgotten, they become the butt of the jokes that go on for a long time. What kind of legacy do you want to leave behind? This is a question that should be answered at a very young age. This is a question that should define us. And what should be remembered about us is the relationship that we have with God. The relationship we have as as part of the bride of Christ. Those are the kind of things that I want to be remembered for. Those are the kinds of things I want you to be remembered for. But if you're not living a life of purpose, if you're not living a life that's worth living, then that's not what you're going to be remembered for. And you will have no enduring legacy. Those that are living this wicked life really have nothing to look forward to. Now, you might say, well, but you see these people on TV and they're living this wicked life and they they have all these friends, they have all these people around them. I'm here to tell you today, they may have people that are around them all the time, but I think they're very lonely people. And those aren't the kinds of friends that you want or the kinds of friends that you need. You you look at people that are living this very wicked, this very worldly life, you say, but yeah, but they have have these huge houses, and they have nice cars, and they have all this money. And that's true. They do have all of those things. But all of those things could be gone tomorrow. None of those things can truly bring you happiness. And yet there are people that try to live their lives as if they do. A life that is, that is marked by blessedness, a, a life that is worth living, has something to look forward to. The thing that's interesting is that probably the one thing that the life that's worth living, the life that's not worth living, have in common is a clear destination. Those living a life that's worth living, those that are blessed, those who are in a relationship with God, have a clear destination. They're going to spend eternity with God in heaven. That's a wonderful place to be. But those who thumb their nose at what's in the Word of God, those who think that they know better, those that are living this life that lacks any kind of substance, they have a destination as well. And there are people today that would tell you that hell's not a real place, that heaven's not a real place. I'm here to tell you, heaven and hell are real places, and where you spend eternity is completely up to you. That's a decision that you have to make. It's a decision that you have to make early in life. It's a decision that you need to make and you need to maintain for the rest of your life. You want to live a life that's worth living? That's wonderful. A life that's worth living has eternal life to look forward to. 
And so this morning, I encourage you to think about what kind of life that you're living. Are you living that life of substance? Are you living a blessed life? Or are you living a wicked life? I still love the Great Gatsby. We were in Costco the other night, and they had a stack of them, and I picked up and just thumbed through it, looked at some of my favorite passages in that book. But where I once envied the wealth and the notoriety that this fictional character, Jay Gatsby, have, I have nothing but pity for that man. I have nothing but pity for that character now because he had all the money in the world. He had a great estate. He had many things going for him, and yet he was not living a life that was worth living. If you're looking for someone to emulate, if you're looking for a character that you'd like to be like, then I suggest you look at the life of Jesus Christ. Jesus lived a life that was worth living. And he didn't have a lot of money. He didn't have a home to call his own. He didn't have a place to lay his head at night. He was crucified on a cross. The most demeaning method of death for the time was reserved for the Son of God. And yet I still say that he lived a life that was worth living. And if you want to start living that kind of life today, we'd love to help you with that. We've got a baptistry back here that's full of water. And we would love to immerse you into the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and for you to start living a life that's worth living. This morning, if you're not living a life that's worth living, if you have gotten off that straight and narrow, if your life doesn't have the substance that it should have, I want to encourage you this morning to make that right. I want to encourage you this morning to think about the legacy that you are, are leaving behind, and I want you to live that blessed life that is worth living. We're going to have an invitation song. If there's something on your heart, if there's something that you need help with, don't be ashamed or embarrassed. This is a group of people that want to help you. Would you come now as we stand and as we sing?